Here we're looking at the second part of chapter 19. The first part was natural selection and Darwin, and now we're looking at the evidence for evolution. So in the first part you made four boxes, so in the second part you're going to continue and do four more boxes. Um, here we're going to look at four pieces of evidence for evolution, uh, direct observations, homology, fossil record, and biogeography. So as we go through the video, go ahead and make notes in each of those boxes as you learn. Okay, so we can see um, evolution in action right in front of us. Um, so one of the pieces of evidence for evolution is actually seeing it happen. Um, you can study in your book, there's a, an inquiry um, about soapberry bugs who have evolved in response to an invasive species in their habitat. When their food source uh, changed, the, their beak sides or like their proboscis coming out of their face evolved in response to the depth of the seeds in the plants. Um, we can also see the beak of the finch in that video that we saw with Rosemary and Peter Grant, how the, um, the beaks of the finch population evolved in response to their environment by natural selection. You can also see in the evolution of bacteria developing drug resistance. Um, one example is we have um, bacteria called MRSA, and um, that's meth methicillin resistance Staphylococcus aureus, where this bacteria, um, when it's been exposed to antibiotics throughout the last few decades, um, if there is a person who has an infection with the bacteria and they take antibiotics, well, when they take antibiotics, uh, maybe one or two of the bacteria in that population have a gene that makes them resistant and the antibiotics can't kill them. So therefore, they have a high fitness. Now, in the next generation, they are the ones who get to reproduce. So let's pretend that this bacteria population right here, uh, most of them end up dying from antibiotics. So in the next generation, you only have a few survivors. However, these survivors are resistant to antibiotics, and therefore, in the next generation, they'll be much more difficult to kill off. Sorry, my face is in the way and you can't see those. Um, but they're going to be drug resistant. And this is an ongoing problem facing um, humanity these days. Uh, when you see antibiotic resistance, um, making it more and more difficult to kill infections with antibiotics. Um, when we see MRSA and the um, amount of, when we look here, the annual, annual hospital admissions with MRSA in measured in thousands, you can see an increase over time in the amount of uh, cases of antibiotic resistance. Here you can see the plasmid from the MRSA uh, bacterium that has the different genes and their um, adaptations to help them survive in environments where antibiotics are killing off the ones who lack the uh, genetics to survive. Another example that we can see um, of evolution is back in the uh, maybe 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, DDT was a very common chemical that was sprayed to kill mosquitoes and other pests. And um, it was very common. It was harmless to humans, didn't have an odor. So we sprayed it all over the place. And what happened, as you apply the DDT, the pesticide, um, there's going to be a few survivors who are resistant. And then it's those survivors who are going to reproduce and pass on the resistance to the next generation. So you have whole populations who become resistant to pesticides, um, and that leads to what's called a pesticide treadmill. You have to use different or stronger pesticides to constantly counteract the evolution of pesticide-resistant insects or, fun or um, plants, etc. Uh, another example of direct observations we're going to see in class is about these lizards on an island. So I just wanted to point that out that we'll see that in class. Uh, now, another piece of evidence is homology, and so this is analyzing similarities between different organisms. So let's remember evolution is a process of descent with modification. That means that as the uh, species evolve over time, they're going to have modifications and be different. So when we look at this, characteristics present in an ancestral organism, so let's pretend this line here is the past and we're moving towards the future this way, towards the present, um, what you can see is as you have evolution happening, characteristics present in an ancestral organism are altered by natural selection in its descendants over time. Because these descendants, once they're geographically isolated, 
are reproductively isolated, they're going to face different environmental conditions. Think about the lions and the tigers, for example. They're on different continents. One's in grasslands, one's in forests. They have different natural selection evolving um, or different selective pressures leading to different cases of natural selection causing the species to evolve to become different, even though they have a common ancestry. So as a result, related species can have characteristics that have underlying similarity, yet function differently. So in the case of the lion and the tiger, that's maybe a little bit too recent of a common ancestor. To explain this a little bit better, we're going to use the evolution of mammals. So mammals uh, cover a wide range of species, from lions all the way to skunks and even animals that live in the ocean, like dolphins or whales. Um, or like sea otters, etc. So in the wide range of mammals, they have a common ancestor that was a mammal. So when we look at homologies between them or homologous structures, we can see in the front limbs of mammals that they all have similar bone structure. And so it's kind of neat to see how the evolution of limbs in these mammals have um, evolved over time, from an ancestral tetrapod, you can see how different environmental pressures, so here you have different selection pressures. You have flying, swimming, running, this is grasping. So in the different habitats, you have different natural selection, which puts different environmental pressures. So you have the evolution of different structures, all from one common ancestor. So when you look at the similarity uh, resulting from common ancestry, it's called homology. Now the underlying skeletons of the arms, forelegs, flippers, or wings of mammals are called homologous structures. They represent variations on a structural theme that was present in their common ancestor. So their common ancestor, well this is a tetrapod, but if you look at a common mammal ancestor, had these bones. And then as the animals diverged, the mammals diverged into different habitats. They had different environmental pressures shaping those limbs to become different. And so this is called divergent evolution. So here you have placental mammals and they're diverging. Even though they have common ancestry and similar structures, they're being selected for in different environments. So here you can see, it, this is a pretty neat picture, um, looking at the ancestral mammal here with fur, and mammary glands. Ooh, my pen's not working. Uh, and then you can see like how you have the branching of marsupials and placental mammals, and then monotremes, which are the egg-laying mammals like the duck-billed platypus. Um, anyway, so when we look at divergent evolution, it's starting with a common ancestor and then diverging to become different. And even though the legs of an elephant and the wing of a bat have incredibly different structures in the adult form, their common ancestry um, is shown in their fossils or in their bone structure, having the similar bones, but they've evolved to have different adult forms. Another homologous structure we can see is in embryos. So one cool thing about embryos in um, vertebrates, things with backbones, is all vertebrates have a dorsal hollow nerve cord and a notochord. But more interestingly is they all have tails. Um, during embryonic development, all vertebrates have a tail, whether the tail stays there as an adult or not. Another cool example are gill slits. This right here is a human, even though my face is cutting off the bottom. And so all vertebrate embryos have pharyngeal gill slits at some point during development. Now, as humans, we don't use gills. Um, and so those structures actually develop into uh, parts of our ears and our throat. So they start out and have homologous structures during development, but then take different adult forms as they, as they develop. Um, and so that would be an example of homologous structures shown in embryology. We also have vestigial structures, which are leftover structures of an organism's ancestors, and they serve little to no function in the descendant. A fun example is whales. Whales have no hind limbs, but they actually have a pelvic bone where legs used to attach in their ancestors. So when we look at the evolution of whales, whales are mammals. 
that their ancestors actually lived on land, and it was a higher fitness if they could actually go into water to hunt. If you think about the iguanas on the Galapagos Islands who go back into the water to eat algae. So here we have the evolution of mammals in the ocean. Their ancestors were on land and evolved to live in water. So when we see this though, like what evidence do we have? We actually have the fossil record. We can see whale evolution through their skeletal structures and ooh, shoot, and see how they have um, and see how they have evolved. And so when we see this whale, we can look at the bone structure, how it's changed over time. We can see the hind limbs here slowly get smaller and then eventually disappear in its modern day descendants. We can look at the skeletal remains and watch the gradual change over 70 million years of whale evolution. We can see how in their ancestor, the nostrils were near the front of their face, and then it slowly moved to the top of their head, where it was a higher fitness to skim the top of the water, to breathe the air rather than stick their whole face up. So we can see the evolution of, our, of whales through the fossil record, and now modern day whales have a pelvic bone, but no legs. That's a vestigial structure of its ancestor showing us its history. We can also see this in snakes. So snakes today don't have legs, but when you look at their ancestors, they had legs. You can also see the um, uh, modern skeletons of snakes have pelvic bones, just like the whales, even though no legs currently attach. However, there are some species of snakes who still have little appendages, even though they're not used for walking. Um, and so you can see also in the snake skeleton how there's a pelvic bone. And then in the snake, some of them have little vestigial legs or little things that come out uh, near that pelvic bone, even though they're not actually legs. So that would be a vestigial structure. Another one, a cool example, are if you look at this fish, you're like, hmm, something's different. There's not very much pigment, kind of see-through, but also it's missing eyeballs. So these are fish that live in caves. They're blind cave fish whose ancestors had eyes, but deep down in the dark caves where there's no light, eyes are not necessary. It's completely pitch black. So it actually was high fitness to evolve to not have eyes simply because why waste resources having eyeballs develop when they're not used? So a mutation that actually stopped eyeball development ended up being high fitness because it conserved resources during development. And the descendants today have eye sockets, which is the vestigial structure showing where eyeballs in their ancestors used to be. So vestigial structures are leftover structures from an organism's ancestors. Here, this eye socket serves little to no function in the descendant. However, it shows that the ancestor of this fish had eyes. Ooh, and then convergent evolution is fascinating. In convergent evolution, animals evolve to look similar and it kind of like is converging even though they don't have a common ancestor recently. So let me explain that with a picture. For example, sharks, ichthyosaurs, and dolphins all look very similar. And you might hypothesize that they have a recent common ancestor that has this body shape. However, one's a fish, one's a reptile, one's a mammal. They do not have a very recent common ancestor of this shape of a streamlined body. Instead, they've all evolved to look very similar because of similar habitat and uh, phenotypes that were high fitness. So this body shape evolved independently three times, if we count a penguin four times, um, even though there was not a common ancestor of these three organisms that had a streamlined body shape like this. Uh, flight, for example, is another example of convergent evolution. This bird, this reptile, and this flying fox um, do not have a common ancestor that flew. And so therefore the flight has evolved three different times. However, it's not because of common ancestry. So when they evolve to look similar, that's convergent evolution versus um, divergent evolution was like the divergence of mammals. That would be divergent, common ancestor evolving to look different. Now we can see this here when you compare animals from Australia and uh, North America. They've diverged, but then evolved to look very similar. And we'll talk more about that in class.